after the liberals, spearheaded by Justin Trudeau himself, spent the last two years accusing conservative politicians of standing with people who wave swastikas. Conservative party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. And of meeting with, quote, known Nazis. I'm just curious if she thinks there should be consequences or, uh, or retromand for members of this house who meet with known Nazis. Does she condemn her actions by meeting with a known Nazi? And as activists on the left freely accused parents who are protesting for parental rights over their own children of being white supremacists. I know that white supremacists are absolutely uh, funding, supporting, and uh, Cajoling parents. Justin Trudeau's government invited an actual Waffen SS Nazi veteran to be recognized in the House of Commons on Friday. Every single person in attendance of Zelensky's speech to Parliament gave a standing ovation to a World War II Nazi veteran. It's hard to overstate the national embarrassment and shame this has caused our country. One international scandal after another, the Trudeau government's incompetence and foolishness has caused yet another national own goal. The federal government is of course pinning all of the blame on the Speaker of the House. In fact, liberals have gone so far as to say that they had no idea this individual is going to be recognized by the Speaker. To assume that Zelensky's speech to Parliament wasn't choreographed by the second is absurd. But it wasn't just the recognition of an actual Nazi soldier in the chamber that is causing all of the national embarrassment for Justin Trudeau. Trudeau announced another commitment of $650 million in aid to Ukraine over the next three years. And while in Toronto, Trudeau and Zelensky were mercilessly booed by Canadians. Protesters were heard yelling at Zelensky, telling him to get out of the country, and the usual label of traitor was hurled at Justin Trudeau. Despite giving the Russians a major unnecessary propaganda victory, all of this has reopened discussions about Ukraine's closeness with neo-Nazis and Canada's willingness to accept members of the Ukrainian SS division into Canada after the war and for the country to honor them in our cemeteries. We'll have all of that and more coming up on this show. Drop a like in the video, help us out by subscribing to the True North YouTube channel. And the common question for the episode is this, is it in Canada's interest to keep funding the Ukrainian war effort? Let me know in the comments and let's get into it. Despite the fact that Canadians across the country are having to handle yet another major embarrassment on the world stage, another example of the humiliation being brought upon us by our own leaders, I think it's safe to assume that many on the conservative opposition benches are feeling a bittersweet sense of schadenfreude today as Justin Trudeau has to handle this latest PR disaster that his government has walked themselves into. That being, of course, inviting an actual Nazi to the House of Commons to be celebrated by everyone. I mean, think about this. The federal government had to go out of their way to not only find an actual living member of the Waffen SS, but bring them to Parliament to be recognized. How many are there even left alive? Speaker of the House Anthony Rota described Yaroslav Hanka of the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS as being a Ukrainian war hero on Friday. After Zelensky's address, newly minted Liberal House Leader Karina Gould and the Speaker of the House Anthony Rota wanted to personally thank this Waffen SS soldier for his heroic service to Ukraine in World War II. Here's a picture of Karina Gould and Anthony Rota holding hands with this man, smiling ear to ear. Karina Gould, of course, deleted that photo after someone in her office came to the realization that actually those who fought against the Soviets in World War II were a part of the Nazis. As the liberals try to throw Anthony Rota under the bus for being the person solely responsible for recognizing the Waffen SS Nazi veteran and for inviting him to attend Zelensky's speech, things just aren't really adding up when it comes to all of this. You see, the granddaughter of the Waffen SS soldier, Teresa Hanka, posted on Facebook a picture of her dear Dito waiting in the reception hall for Trudeau and Zelensky. So this man, this Nazi veteran, 
was not only just invited to attend Zelensky's speech, but was also invited to attend the reception with the Prime Minister and Zelensky. Are we to believe that Trudeau and Zelensky didn't take a picture with this man? And if so, where is that picture I think we'd all like to see? The 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS rebranded themselves in 1945 as the first Ukrainian division of the Ukrainian National Army. But even a quick five minute Google search of what the Ukrainian first division really is would lead someone to realize that these people were in fact part of the Nazi war machine and were involved in several atrocious acts of war crimes. A 2020 article written in Esprit de Corps, the Canadian military magazine about this specific division would clear up almost all of the confusion regarding the name change and who these people truly were. Take a look at this. Among the commanding officers of the SS Galicia was Ukrainian born SS Hauptsturmfuhrer Heinrich Wiens, who served with the Einsatzgruppen D murder squad and personally took part in mass executions of Jews. Another division officer, SS Obersturm Banfuhrer Franz Magal was also a seasoned killer of Jews. SS Galicia worked alongside SS Sonder Battalion Derlewanger, a unit that contained rapists, murderers, and the criminally insane, and the two organizations at times transferred officers between each unit. In addition, SS Galicia had officers and NCOs who came from the Nachtigal Battalion, a Ukrainian collaboration organization that had taken part in the mass killings of Jews in the summer of 1941. And you know what? It turns out actually that Canada had at the time brought in over 2,000 members of this particular Waffen-SS Galicia division, the same division that Yaroslav Hanka fought in. In that same outlet, Esprit de Corps, in 2020, an article written by veteran military journalist David Pugliez about the Ukrainian-Canadian Servicemen's Association explains how Canada welcomed into our country 2,000 members of the same Waffen-SS Galicia division that Yaroslav Hunka fought in during World War II. Flight Lieutenant Bodon Panchuk was the man behind the Ukrainian-Canadian Servicemen's Association, which supported the cultural and social needs of Canadians of Ukrainian heritage serving overseas during the Second World War. Panchuk was also involved in the effort that saw as many as 30,000 Ukrainian refugees brought to Canada after the war. The media focus on Panchuk, who died in 1987, came about because Ukrainian groups in Canada and the United Kingdom were honoring him and the UCSA by unveiling a stained glass window on the 75th anniversary of victory in Europe. But missing from the accolades in the Globe and Mail article and the CBC broadcast about his death were the details about some of the Ukrainian refugees that Panchuk managed to convince the Canadian government to accept. 2,000 members of Adolf Hitler's Waffen-SS. Panchuk was able to get members of the 14th Waffen-SS Division Galicia into Canada by lying about their past. In fact, there are several monuments to this Waffen-SS Ukrainian division across the country in our cemeteries. But the connection of Ukrainian Nazis to the Canadian government goes even deeper than what we're seeing here. Not only did Canada, after the war, bring in so many members of this SS division to the point where we're now having monuments in our cemeteries for these Nazi soldiers. In fact, it is well known that Canadian soldiers before the war with Russia began in 2022, trained with members of the Azov Battalion, a unit in the Ukrainian army that freely sports neo-Nazi imagery as part of their personal branding. And it's not as if Canada didn't know about the Azov Battalion's connection to neo-Nazis. It turns out that a year before the meeting between the Canadians and the Azov Battalion, a briefing about the connections between neo-Nazism and the Azov Battalion was provided to the Canadian government. When Justin Trudeau was last in Ukraine, he proudly met with a man named Andrei Melnik, the former Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, who was a known Holocaust denier and a Stepan Bandera apologist. And in 2019, Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland met with a man named Andrei Perubi, who was the former speaker of the Ukrainian National Congress. 
Peruby is the co-founder of a far-right fascist party in Ukraine styled off of Hitler's Nazi party. And immediately after Russia invaded Ukraine, Christia Freeland at a rally in Toronto was seen holding up a Stepan Bandera blood and soil era scarf at the protest. When she was called out by journalists for holding up a scarf, a scarf that venerates a man who was a known Nazi collaborator, Freeland deleted the photo and had her office hound the journalists that wrote the story. When you put all of this together with the understanding that Christia Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada's own grandfather, was in fact a Nazi propagandist, this photo of Christia Freeland grinning like a Cheshire cat while applauding the Waffen-SS soldier becomes all the more wild. Does she really expect Canadians to believe that she doesn't know Yaroslav Hunka's Nazi connections? when her own grandfather was a Nazi? Whenever anyone in the media raises the connection of neo-Nazis and Ukraine, they are immediately labeled as Putin propagandists, of people pushing Kremlin propaganda. But the evidence has now been laid out for the entire world to see. Whether those in the legacy media who slander journalists who call attention to this stuff like it or not. When I called attention to Justin Trudeau meeting and shaking the hand of a known Holocaust denier, journalists like Andrew Coyne accused True North and myself of pushing Putin propaganda. And the University of Calgary's School of Public Policy published a report putting True North's own Rupa Subramania, the leader of the PPC, Maxime Bernier, and Ezra Levant, the founder of Rebel News, as accounts on Twitter pushing Russian propaganda. Jewish groups and our international allies are rightfully fuming over this situation. The Canadian Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs issued this statement after members were seen applauding Yaroslav Hunka. We are deeply troubled and disturbed that a Ukrainian veteran of the infamous 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the Nazi SS, which actively participated in the genocide of Jews, was celebrated with a standing ovation in the Canadian Parliament. Canada's Jewish community stands firmly with Ukraine in its war against Russian aggression, but we can't stay silent when crimes committed by Ukrainians during the Holocaust are whitewashed. And Poland's ambassador to Canada is now demanding that the Canadian government issue a formal apology to Poland for honoring this man in the House of Commons. Canadian and Ukrainian leadership at the House of Commons cheered a member of the Waffen-SS Galizian notorious Ukrainian military formation of World War II responsible for murdering thousands of Poles and Jews. Poland, the best ally Ukraine has, will never agree on whitewashing such villains. As Polish ambassador to Canada, I expect an apology. Roughly 4% of the Canadian population is made up of people with Ukrainian heritage. To assume that that does not sway the government's response to this war is of course ridiculous. Playing to the very large Ukrainian voter base in this country is clearly a tactic of both parties and has been for a long time now. But look at, for example, how other countries have handled this war. The United States, the country who is by far supporting Ukraine the most with military and financial aid, has what I would consider to be a very healthy debate on the issue. US Republicans are almost entirely opposed to giving the Ukraine more money. In fact, the US Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans, they didn't even meet with Zelensky before Zelensky came to Canada. Unlike last year, Zelensky wasn't invited to address the House and the Senate. In Canada, anyone who believes that it is not in the best interest of Canadians for us to maintain funding Ukraine or to go to war in Ukraine is deemed a Putin propagandist. After all of this in the House of Commons, Trudeau and Zelensky made their way to Toronto where they were to address a large crowd of supporters. Only problem for them was that a very large crowd of protesters gathered outside the venue and mercilessly booed both of them when they entered and left the venue. <laughs> At his speech in Toronto, Trudeau wasn't heard calling for an end to the war, calling for a peaceful resolution to a crisis that has resulted in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths. No, no, Trudeau was seen beating the drums of war and repeating the line that Canada will be there with whatever it takes for as long as it takes. 
Here is Justin Trudeau in a totally sane manner delivering that speech. Canadians know this is a question of right or wrong. Canadians know that, yes, it is incredibly hard for Ukraine to continue to stand against a Russian aggression. And let's be honest, it's hard for the democracies around the world who are there to support their citizens, who are investing for the future, who are challenged with a challenging economy around the world to continue to step up as Canada has with close to $9 billion in aid for Ukraine. But we will because the cost on Canadians, on our lives, on our world will be so much greater if Putin wins this war that we will and have to stand every single day until Ukraine wins this war. The Liberals want Canadians to not politicize the incident of them inviting a Waffen SS veteran to the House of Commons. While for the past two years, demonizing conservatives for meeting with people who they accused of being Nazis and white supremacists, but were in fact people who criticized the government. Famously, Justin Trudeau told conservative MP Melissa Lanceman that her and her party were standing with those who waved swastikas and Confederate flags during the Freedom Convoy. Conservative party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. Canada's a new Minister of Mental Health, which is one of the funniest jokes around, Yara Sachs, during the Freedom Convoy, said that Honk Honk was an acronym for Hail Hitler. Remember this. How much vitriol do we have to see of Honk Honk, which is an acronym for Hail Hitler, do we need to see by these protesters on social media? And here's Liberal MP Jennifer O'Connell accusing Leslie Lewis of meeting with a known Nazi who in fact was just a conservative member of European Parliament who has done more to oppose Justin Trudeau and the Liberals in Canada than many of the conservative MPs who sit in Ottawa. I'm just curious if she thinks there should be consequences or, uh, or retromand for members of this house who meet with known Nazis. Does she condemn her actions by meeting with a known Nazi? All right, everyone, that's gonna do it for us today on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Harrison Faulkner, and this is Ratio.